it seems like we lost touch with the art of waiting. I get it. Waiting just sucks. Waiting is hard. But I think waiting reflects something deeper. Something that I hope we haven't lost. Waiting. I'm glad that uh, you have decided to brave another night as we get ready to open up the Word just for a uh, few minutes and talk about the Advent season. As we learned last week, much of it is actually uh, rooted in, in very deep, deep history, deep, deep history. We learned last week that the Advent is just the Americanized word for, for Adventus, which is a Latin phrase that just means the coming. And so we talked last week about waiting. We talked about waiting as in waiting is hard. Anybody else relate to that? Waiting is hard. I, I don't know about you, but I don't like waiting in life. I don't like waiting in fast food li uh, lines. I don't like waiting in the drive through and, and if you really want to get my crawl, drive 30 mile an hour in the passing lane. I don't like waiting behind you there either. And, and so, but, but we talked about some of that last week. And, and so just uh, if, if you're looking for those, the notes are available. And thank you for your patience as uh, we went through everything and sort of set the foundation how this is going to unfold the next few weeks. I encourage you to go to the podcast. I encourage you to go to the website, pull this information down, grab it, and uh, let's walk through this together. Tonight, I, last week was waiting hard. Tonight is waiting through. How many people know that sometimes you've just got to walk through something? You, 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 sometimes it's not just enough to sit there and let things pass by you. Sometimes there's things that you have to walk through. And sometimes you have to wait through something. You have to wait through. We, the old saints used to talk about praying through. Praying through. The, the, the old tradition of uh, instead of running your mouth to your friends, you ran your mouth to God and you prayed through, you know? Those old traditions of instead of getting on Facebook and, and, and talking about your problems to everybody else, you instead came to the altar and you talked about the problems to the one who could do something about it. You know, there, there, there's, a, there's something about that, you know? There's something, there's something about recognizing that we can't do this on our own, that it takes someone bigger than us, more powerful than us, more a longer lasting than us, somebody who's got a better perspective than us, and sometimes, sometimes we just have to learn to wait through something. So tonight, that's where we're going to be, waiting through. So here's my questions for tonight. What happens when you aren't quite where you thought you would be by now in life? You made your plans, you thought you knew exactly where you were going, you laid everything out, you had everything lined up in your head, but somewhere along the way, something derailed you and you're not where your plans had mapped it out. You're in between. You laid out your education plan, you laid out your work plan, you laid out your friend plan, you laid out your family plan, and somehow the world and all of its muck and chaos came in and swooped in and derailed your train. And now you're waiting on something else to happen, and you're waiting through. Life has brought you to some weird point where the doors that have closed behind you still have not released you because the ones in front of you have not opened yet. And so you're waiting through. You're in between. You're not where you were, but you're not where you're going. You're stuck. You're in between. Psychologists would use a fancy word for this and call it liminal space. It just means you're not there and you're not there. Ever felt like you're there? 
we've all been there in our life. In fact, I'm going to guess that there's a large portion of us there right now. Maybe you remember what it's like growing up, and this is the easiest example I could come up with. We walked around, and we pretended to everyone that we were adults. Sometimes we pretended by how we talked to our parents, right? We weren't adults. Sometimes, sometimes we would say something like, well, I'm old enough to do this. And you just have somebody else look at you, but you're not old enough to do this. You're in between. I wrote down on my notes those times when, when, you, when, you, when you're at the family reunions and you're at the family dinners and you're acting like you're all this and all that and you still got to sit at the kids' table. Anybody else had to do that? I want y'all to picture six foot five me trying to sit in a little three foot chair. In between. And although we don't like it very much, it's where we spend most of our life. We can't go back to where we started and the doors haven't opened to where we're going. Many of you have perhaps, at least I hope, I'm not falling on deaf ears, seen the movie Tom Hanks put out called The Terminal, where he's trapped. Uh, the point of the movie was that Tom, while he was in air, his country that he was from experienced a revolution. And so all of a sudden, all their passports got voided. So he couldn't go into the next country, but he couldn't go back to where he was from. Now, as funny as that sounds... What you may not have known and what I didn't know is that movie is actually based on a true story. It actually happened. There was a man by the name of Moran Nasiri, and he was expelled from Iran for protesting against the Shah. And after a long battle, a long battle arguing back and forth and involving applications to several countries, he was finally awarded refugee status by the United Nations to Belgium. Now, he had a British parent, at least one, and so he decided he would go to the UK and live there in 1986. But on his way to the UK, his briefcase all of a sudden got sent somewhere else. Now, imagine that. Has anyone else ever lost luggage that's traveling? Well, unfortunately, his briefcase contained all of his papers. And he had boarded the plane from London, but when he got there, he was returned back to France, who he was traveling through, because he didn't have his passport nor the rest of the papers to enter the country. He was initially arrested by the French, but then he was released as his entry to the airport was completely legal, and he had no country of origin to be returned to. Thus, he began his residency at terminal number one. His case was later taken on by, by a human rights lawyer named Christian Bourget. And in 1992, now I want you to already think of the number of years in this, in 1992, it finally made it to a French court who ruled that he had entered the country legally and because of that, he could not be expelled from the airport. But that same court ruled that they did not have the authority to give him permission to stay on French soil. So guess what? He returned to terminal number one. He tried to get new documents back from Belgium, but the authorities said that you can only do so in person. But he couldn't get the documents to get over there. So finally, they got Belgium to agree but someone objected and said he left Belgium voluntarily after he was a refugee, and because of that, he could not return at all. Nasiri's stay at the airport ended in July of 2006, when he was finally hospitalized, and his sitting place was then dismantled. Towards the end of January 2007, he left the hospital and he was looked after by the equivalent of the French Red Cross. He was lodged in a hotel in the air, not too far from the airport, and on March 6th, 
he was transferred to a shelter to live out the rest of his days. During his 17-year-long stay in Terminal Number 1 at the Charles de Gaulle Airport, Nasiri had his luggage at his side, and he spent all of his time reading, writing in his diary, studying in economics. He received all his food and his newspapers from the employees of the airport. In fact, here's a picture of him living at the airport for 17 years. He had made a nest. For 17 years, he was waiting. He couldn't go back where he was from, and he couldn't move forward to the next door. He was stuck in the in-between. What a thought. Now, to you, that may absolutely seem absurd in a random case. But tonight, I have a question. How many of you have put off decisions and frozen your life for years? For one reason or another, you have absolutely hit pause on your life, and right now, in your own mind, you are tracking back and realizing that you have not moved forward in that particular area in years. You made the commitment, you made the, you made the challenge, but you've not taken the step. You're in between. And whether or not you realize it or not, it is as paralyzing to you as Nasiri stay at the airport. How about this one? I'll make something that's a little fun out of this. How many in here know that they need to get in shape? Look to your neighbor and say, he's talking about you. You've known it. For years, the doctor has told you you need to get in shape. The mirrors in your house have told you that you need to get in shape. The bathroom scales have stopped talking to you because they feel like it's useless because you know you need to get in shape. But yet, you still stop at every gas station in town and pick up a Diet Coke in a Snickers bar thinking you're fooling somebody and walk around holding the Diet Coke high enough and telling everybody you're trying to lose weight. Turn to your other neighbor and say, you ain't trying to lose weight. Face it, we're not trying to lose weight. We're not. If we wanted to lose weight, we would get up in the morning, we would exercise, we would in total making my mother mad decide not to eat everything on our plate and our neighbor's plate that didn't finish their dessert. <laughs> and all of a sudden, our annual renewal notice to get in shape would mean something. If we really wanted to do it, we would do it. But we don't. We don't. Because we're in between. And in between means we can't see the results that we want right now. In between means that, that the door hasn't opened and everything on the other side of the door is a matter of faith, not of sight. And we have decided that we are not making a step until all of a sudden we don't have to have faith that we have to see where we're going. And so we choose to lock ourselves in between. What about something more spiritual? You start the year, and you decide, I'm going to read the Bible every day. Let's do something elementary. And you get through Genesis, and you're not really sure how you got through Genesis, and you hit numbers, and you're like, whoa. You get to Leviticus, and all the laws just start running together. And by the end of February, the daily devotion that you promised God is just something in a faint memory and something you decide you're going to start over and do every week. 
And somewhere in April, you stop lying to yourself and admit, I'm really not going to do it. Or how about this? You come to church, you're screaming in pain. You know that you know that you know that God told you this is exactly where you need to be. You run to the altar. You run to the altar. God swoops in. His Holy Spirit just absolutely envelops you, and you have all this zeal. And you know, you know that the next step is plugging in and doing something. But instead of that, you choose to sit on your blessed assurance and let church happen rather than participating in it. And yet, maybe I've gotten used to in-between. We're the ones holding ourselves hostage. Not some airport, not some random government. At this point in our life, we've become our worst enemy. It's December 9th tonight. We've got plus or minus a few 20 days till we make those annual commitments, New Year's resolutions. We swear we're going to do better every single year. We announce our intentions. We walk away from the bad habits. But somehow, truth is when things get tough, we find ourselves looking back longingly at that, thinking life wasn't that bad, and justifying stepping backwards. And whether it's our bad habits or personal goals, you need to know at some point we have to make the decision that, to move forward, whether or not we can see the answer. I have an illustration. I couldn't find the white robe, so we're going to use this one. I'm going to hope that you can see this. That's what it looks like. The rope is just time. There's a beginning. There will be an end to this world. This little black piece of duct tape that I hope you can see represents our time on earth. There was time in front of us there's time after us. And truth be known, there's an entire eternity after we die. And somehow, some reason, we have lost the ability to take this into perspective. Somehow, we have forgotten that what we do here determines all of this. Somehow, we have stopped teaching that you have to make the right decision here to follow Christ if you want what's good for you all the way out here. Somehow, we have decided that we had better be happy now regardless of what it does right here. Somehow we have decided that we are going to trade a little bit of happiness now for a lot of badness later. Somehow we have decided that, that, that all of a sudden this little life that we have right here is more important than the eternal life that is going to be out here. Somehow we have decided that we are going to blind ourselves to the decisions we make every day. And all of this hangs in the balance. And we're so worried that we live life in between and it's uncomfortable that we decide that our comfort is more important than our eternity. Amen or oh me? This is real stuff. And so we lock ourselves in between. We're stuck. Luke 7. If you have your Bibles, open up to Luke 7. Beginning with verse 18. The disciples of John the Baptist told John about everything Jesus was doing. So John called for two of his disciples. And he sent them to the Lord and told them to ask him this, 
Are you the Messiah we have been expecting, or should we keep looking for someone else? John's two disciples found Jesus and said to him, John the Baptist has sent us to ask this question. Are you the Messiah we've been waiting on, or should we keep looking? At that very time, Jesus cured many people of their diseases, their illnesses, and evil spirits. He restored sight to many who were blind. Then he told John's disciple, go back to John. Tell him what you've seen and heard, that the blind are seeing, that the lame are walking, that the lepers are cured, that the deaf hear and the dead are raised to life, and the good news is now being preached to the poor. And tell him this also, God blesses those who are not offended because of me. I believe, I believe that John wasn't happy he had to wait. I think at this point, at this point, hope had gotten tough for him. Otherwise, why would he send someone to ask the question? He didn't understand where he was, and I think at this time he was depressed enough to not, not understand exactly why he was there. And perhaps the saddest part of this story is that Jesus' response wasn't anything new. John had seen these miracles before. He had heard about these miracles before. The only new part was the very last sentence that said this, God blesses those who aren't offended because of me. John found himself with a very tough decision. He could believe what God said was true and have faith at what was coming to pass. Or he could just stare at the bars in the jail cell, swear this situation isn't really God's will, and then look for a Messiah. Either John really asked that question and meant it, or John was a trickster. And I choose to say he meant his question. I think John had to consider in his life, do I continue to wait with faith or do I go back and look for somebody else? What about you? Are you offended when God tells you to wait? Are you offended when God says, hey, you're probably going to have to sit down for a while before you're rescued? Before you see the next door open, you're probably going to have to sit there in the dark. Is the circumstance you're living in more than you can bear? And are you ready to quit? Tonight, I came to tell somebody in this room that God is telling you to wait. It's the only answer I've got. We don't like to wait. We get frustrated we get upset, we get, we get tension-filled, we get unsettled, disheveled, we get angry. We're always in a rush to get to the next place and do the next thing. And God, the whole time, is saying, listen, I promised you great things, but you're going to have to wait in between. Here's five quick reasons to wait. I promise you, it won't take just a second. Number one, waiting will reveal our true motives. Waiting will, re will reveal our true motives. You see, waiting has a way of bringing out the best and the worst of people. People who don't have good motives will not wait long. You can guarantee that because they're more interested in the result in the process. They want short-term gains rather than a long-term benefit. Number two, number two, not only will waiting, waiting reveal our true motives, waiting will build patience. Waiting will reveal and build patience. Listen, patience in waiting for small things leads to having patience for enduring the bigger things. Let me say that again. 
Patience in waiting for the small things leads to patience in dealing for the big things. Number three, waiting builds anticipation. Number three, waiting builds anticipation. Why do kids get so excited at Christmas? Because they had to wait. Why do we get so excited when, when we're preparing for something? Because it's wait. Well, think about your birthday. Think about a party. Think about something. You're excited for it. Number four, waiting transforms our character. Waiting transforms our character. You see, listen, waiting has a way of rubbing off the rough edges of our lives. Just like in Moses' life, you know the story. He starts out his life and he's, he's rough around the edges. He's, he's upset. In fact, his, his attitude leads him to kill someone. And it takes 40 years in the desert to rub the rough edges off him and Israel alike. Waiting will rub off the edges and transform our character. And number five, waiting builds dependence on God. Waiting builds dependence on God. The reason we are able to open up and read about the great men and women of the Bible is because they all have one thing in common. They were all people who learned their success in life was directly proportional to their dependence on God. Listen to that sentence again. The reason we're able to read about the great men and women in the Bible is because they have one thing in common. They were all people who learned their success in life was directly proportionate to their dependence on God. For them, a relationship with God wasn't about getting rich quick. It was a matter of life and death and eternal at that. Folks, waiting is hard. We know that. We learned that last week. But if we're really going to learn something about the Advent season, then we also need to learn to wait through. Thank you so very much for joining us here today at Church in the Rock. If this is your first time, let me encourage you to go to JesusTheRock.org. There you can find out any information on us, look at our latest podcast or our blogs. If you'd like to give to our ministries financially, you can easily do so by clicking on the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen on our website. Have a blessed day.